All right, hi again, Attorney Steve, welcome back. We are talking in this video about Siemens lawsuit. Okay, so this is news here. This is a recent case filed by Siemens Product Lifecycle Management Software, Inc. I have to say that really slow because you try to say that fast, good luck. Siemens lawsuit, okay, so Siemens is filing a, has filed a new lawsuit as you can see here in our Pacer tracker. Um, a new lawsuit was filed in July 9th, 2018, and it was against, uh, well, that's plaintiff asking for a jury demand, so they want this to go to a jury trial. And the cause of action here is copyright infringement. And as you can see, the nature of the suit is, is code number 820 in PACER. And this is a federal question. If you've watched any of my videos on federal court jurisdiction, you know that one way to get into federal court is with a federal question. Very good if you nailed that. And what's a federal question? Something that deals with a federal law, statute, or treaty, such as the copyright, United States Copyright Act. Okay, so this is general legal information only and not legal advice. So I'm going to give you just a look at the complaint. If you're an engineer and you got a, a notice of, of infringement from your ISP, asking you to file a motion to quash or respond, those kinds of things, this video may be helpful for you, okay? So our firm helps a lot of companies and engineers um, that have been accused of illegally downloading these videos. Uh, not videos, but the software, I should say. We also do video cases. Uh, but at any rate, let's take a look here. So we have Reed Smith LLP. This is a law firm. We've dealt with them many times. And you can see down here they're located in Houston, Texas. But if I come down here into the docket, this is the court docket, they have sued 107 different parties. Okay, so that's 107 what we call Doe defendants in one lawsuit. Okay, so this is what we call a, like a mass lawsuit. Okay, so you have 107 different people being sued. Right now they're identified only as their IP address. But that's what happen is, happens is they send a letter to the, to the ISP saying, it's a subpoena actually, we need to get the name of the subscriber and potentially name them on the lawsuit. So um, we help keep people off the lawsuit and try to get these cases settled. Okay, uh, but let's take a look at the court docket. And if you've never seen a federal court docket, this is kind of what they look like. Um, you have the complaint which was filed and I'm going to take a look at that in a second to show you what that's all about. We have a bunch of exhibits here. Um, these are copyright registration certificates. Um, you also have here, um, this is a, well I don't know what that is, that's an attachment for, this is to the register of copyright. So what happens, and you can see that down here too, um, is when you file a federal court lawsuit alleging copyright infringement, you know, as a plaintiff, you notify the Copyright Office, the United States Copyright Office, which is located in Washington, D.C. You got it. And so you notify them. So you see that there's also a corporate disclosure statement. I think we did a video on this about what that is as a as a corporation. You're just letting the judge know who the stakeholders are so that if the judge needs to recuse him or herself, they can do that. Um, you see here a motion for discovery, a motion for discovery. Now, what that is, is they file the lawsuit. So they file the complaint, as you see here. And then they also file, as you can see, same day, July 9th, 2018, they file a motion for discovery. What they're doing is telling the judge, I don't know who these people are. We need to find out so that maybe we can name them in a lawsuit. But they asked the court for what we call early discovery. Ask the, asking the court, can we send a subpoena to the internet service provider, the ISP, like Comcast or Charter, um, you know, Verizon, these different ISPs. So that is the motion. I'm not going to go through that. I might do that on a different video if anybody shows any interest, just to show you what that looks like. If you have any interest, put it in the comments section below and, I, and I'll do a video on it, okay? Um, and so anyway, so that's what we're looking at. Let's go to the complaint. So you can see it's a, it's a short docket. The, the judge signed the order right here saying, go ahead, go for it. And you, if you are on the receiving end, they send a notice to the ISP. The ISP sends a notice to you and you call us and say, what the heck's going on? What do I do? Where do I stand? What's this going to cost? 
and we can help you with a free initial consultation on that, okay? So, but let's take a look at the complaint so you understand what's going on here. So again, you see the complaint with the different exhibits. I'm not gonna go through that. Let's go through just as an eight page complaint. This is very simple. As you saw, they paid 400 bucks to file this. And then what happens is they go out and they, they do the service of, of process. They, they send the subpoenas. They can't get the case settled. They end up serving the plaintiff. They find out their identity and they serve them. Summons and complaint. Okay, so let's take a look. Um, here's your case number up here, if this thing goes away. <laughs> Um, oh, we've got it right here too. So your case number 4 colon 18 dash CV dash 2344 filed in the Southern District of Texas, Houston Division. Okay. Um, our firm has been admitted there. So um, at any rate, we have Siemens Product Lifecycle Management Software, Inc. They're the plaintiff. And we have Doe's 1 through 107. They're the defendant. So usually we get calls from one of the 107 defendants going, I'm one of them, I don't know which one. Um, at any rate, this is a complaint for copyright infringement. Plaintiff wants a jury trial. Usually with a jury trial, you have to request it or you waive it. So that's what they're doing. Um, they talk a little bit about their company. Here's, here's a look, you can pause this and read this stuff if you want, it's up to you. Uh, but they just talk about what a Doe defendant is. We don't actually know who they are. We're, they're known by an IP address, okay? And so we don't really know, but we're going to find out kind of thing, okay? So I'm not going to go too much into that. Jurisdiction and venue. Um, now, this is where the motion to quash sometimes comes in, where you say, well, wait a second. I'm not, I'm not in this um, jurisdiction. You know, I don't live here. I, I live in California or I live in Arizona. Why am I being sued in, in uh, Texas? So this is sometimes, and it says right here, in personal jurisdiction, you know, this is sometimes something that could be challenged in a motion to quash. But as you can see, they're saying a substantial part of the acts of infringement complained of herein may have occurred in may have occurred in the district and or defendant without the con con so, and they make an allegation that you have purposely availed themselves of services of an ISP located in this district. So they're really, uh, you know, pushing it on jurisdiction. But, you know, it's uh, one of the things I've seen in these cases in regards to a motion to quash is I've seen a part, you know, I've seen the argument being made by the software company that the brunt of the damage has been felt in this district. And we've seen courts um, like the Northern District of California, we've seen courts agree to that and grant jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction over a defendant based on the brunt of the damage argument. So um, this is something that you look at in every case. I guess the downside is you can file a motion to quash. If they know exactly where you live, it could theoretically be refiled in a new district. It may raise the cost of settlement, you know, poke the bear as I call it sometimes. So it's something you want to talk about with your copyright lawyer. Now, let's go down. Here's the cause of action. It's very simple. As you can see, it's infringement of copyrights against does 1 through 107. So it's the same cause of action against everybody. Um, here they talk about their products, the PLM, Product Lifecycle Management. And it talks a little bit about that. Product Lifecycle Management software brings together computer-aided design, that's CAD, computer-aided manufacturing, that's CAM, computer-aided engineering, product data management, let's go down here, PDM as they call it, and then they allege the different products that they have. So you may have downloaded any of these products and used them, um, NX9, NX10, NX11. Uh, these guys have a ton of products, by the way. Um, uh, Solid Edge, number nine, we have Solid Edge here is another product. And then coming down, we have FEMAP is another one, the NX Nastrin 10. So they're alleging that one or more of these software products has been infringed. So um, that's what they're talking about. Uh, let's see. These products, as you can see, constitute their valuable intellectual property. So that's what they're telling you there. And they discuss this, the uh, copyright registrations there. So you can go through all that if you want and what else do we have here so um they talk about the exclusive rights copyright holder we've done a video on this the exclusive bundle of rights that a copyright holder has 
Two of those are the rights to reproduce, as you see here, and the rights to distribute. Um, so when you're taking a copy of a piece of software, downloading it onto your computer, you're copying and reproducing it onto your computer. If you don't have a license, that's infringement. That's what some people call piracy, okay? And it's important to know that in, the, in these cases, sometimes we're dealing with employees and employers. Employers may be liable for their employees, so it can get a little bit messy. And also, officers and directors of the company can actually be held personally liable if there's willful intentional infringement. So things can get a little bit dicey. That's what we're here for is to kind of help, you know, sort out the sort out the mess. So, um, but that's kind of what they're alleging. We can go down, um, I'll just go down. I think that's probably, they are alleging, um, let's see here. This is important. They're alleging willful intentional infringement or disregard of the rights of the plaintiff. So the reason this is important is if they can prove willful infringement, they can seek statutory damages up to $150,000 per title plus their attorney fees. <coughs> Excuse me. So the damages can get quite staggering. So it's our job to lessen that, reduce that, show that it's innocent, and mitigate the damages and the liability. Okay, so as you can see here, they're claiming we're entitled to statutory damages. Like I said, that's a, that could be a huge liability for a company. And um, they're entitled to actual damages according to proof. So the alternative to seeking statutory damages is seeking actual damages, okay? Actual damages mean they could try to recover for the license, the cost of the license, if you have it installed on... 10 different computers. They could also seek, you can see here, plaintiff is entitled to an accounting, an accounting. So they could find out how much you made in profits. Maybe you made a million dollars in profits and they say, well, the heck with statutory damages. I want to do uh, an accounting and holy cow, let's go for the million. That's a better deal. And, you know, so all I can say is the liability can go through the roof and, and this is why. Okay. Copyright law, it's a great statute for plaintiffs. Why? It involves attorney fees. This is a law that was essentially crafted by music companies, entertainment companies, software companies, you know, video game companies, big industries that have got together. We all know they lobby Congress. They get those good laws. They extend the length of the copyrights. I mean, it's, so this is a beefy statute that if you received one of these letters, just ignoring it and potentially risking a default judgment, can be very, very risky. So um, again, let's just go down to the bottom. So here's what they end up asking for. I'll go a little slower so you can pause this and read it if you want. They want an injunction. That means stop using our software. And here we go. Statutory damages, accounting, um, accounting for revenues, enhanced damages, costs, you know, the $400 and any costs incurred. Attorney fees, as I said. Now, the problem with attorney fees, as I tell everybody, um, you can get up against a intellectual property firm and they put two, three, even four. I've seen four attorneys on a case before. What do they do? Bill, 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 bill. The bill, your bill goes goo, 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 goo. So what happens is if you, you know, get in this situation and you're liable, you end up paying not only your own law firm like us, to defend you, but you also end up paying their attorney fees plus your damages. So trust me, the liability is really, really high. That's why you're incentivized to answer these, come in, get your damages reduced, you know, find a way to, to settle the case, license the software, you reduce your infringement attorney fees, and try to get a fair deal and get this thing settled anonymously without your name being put in a lawsuit. That's what we do. Um, so that's about it, but I just wanted you to, to take a look at what a complaint looks like with Siemens. This has been a general overview of a Siemens lawsuit. If you've received a letter, need some help, free consultation, give us a ring. You can find out our contact information. My email, it's all at attorneysteve.com, attorneysteve.com. So we've helped a lot of people, and we, you know we look forward to helping you too. So give us a call. We're happy to give you some general information about your case. Okay. Take care. Attorney Steve, feel free to share this video on your social media networks. Thanks a lot. Bye now.